What if you could use solid blocks of metal as a fuel in a solid-state desktop-sized nuclear fusion reactor operating at room temperatures? One way to do this would be to trap nuclear fusion fuel between the atoms of a solid metal and bombard it with electromagnetic energy. This is no longer science fiction. Welcome to the world of lattice confinement fusion. In 2021, NASA researchers working at Los Alamos published their findings after observing fusion reactions in deuterium-doped metals when focused Bremsstrahlung radiation was delivered via an electron beam. This research was done in order to devise a compact nuclear fusion power system suitable for spacecraft, and this research yielded both a theoretical paper and experimental results. We've discussed nanomaterial fission systems on this channel before, but we should realize the conditions needed for fission differ dramatically from those required for fusion. While achieving fission in a solid-state device using metamaterials is impressive, it's nothing compared to achieving fusion in a similar setup. Being able to harness fusion energy in a small device, even at low efficiency, is a major change in how we'll be able to use fusion on spacecraft in the future. The NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts, or NIAC, program has funded a concept for a Europa subsurface probe in 2023, a proposal which includes a lattice confinement fusion power source. Lattice confinement fusion, or LCF, may use a solid-state fuel, but it also relies on an external radiation source, which is usually provided by a relativistic electron beam or fission device. The objective of these high-power sources is to produce Bremsstrahlung radiation, which acts on atoms within the optically focused beam. What is this oddly named radiation and why does it matter? Imagine a particle accelerating at relativistic speed, up to say 50% of the speed of light, though the exact value is arbitrary. As the particle accelerates, it generates what is known as a Rendler horizon, in the direction opposite to motion. This horizon is essentially making the universe behind the particle inaccessible for the particle, since it will never be able to return to that space without experiencing massive acceleration in a new direction. As the particle speeds up, the Rendler horizon gets closer and it produces more Bremsstrahlung radiation, which bathes the accelerating particle. When viewed from an external observer, Bremsstrahlung radiation appears as an analog to thermal energy, meaning it can collide with the particle and heat it up. By focusing a beam of electrons traveling at relativistic speed, a beam of Bremsstrahlung radiation is also produced in the optical path. This radiation is needed to make lattice confinement work, because it can dissociate deuterium atoms found in the fuel material. This is known as photodissociation. In simple terms, you should think of the radiation as an analog for photons in this context. We have an age-old problem in nuclear fusion. In fusion, extremely high temperatures are needed to achieve a reaction. At the same time, atoms with high thermal loads strongly repel other particles, requiring most fusion reactors to compress fuel material very quickly. Lattice confinement gets around this problem by allowing a solid metal lattice to contain the fusion fuel, preventing it from escaping as it's pumped with energy. This solves the historic problem of energized fusion fuel quickly expanding and losing the density it needs to maintain a fusion reaction. This problem is associated with the Coulomb barrier, which is the force of electrostatic repulsion that must be overcome to allow two nuclei to fuse. More on this later. You probably noticed that this method sounds suspiciously like cold fusion, and you'd be right. Fusion can occur at room temperature and pressures using this method. Quote, Previous deuterium-tritium fusion research with tokamaks has relied upon temperatures 10 times the center of the sun, yet the NASA method accomplishes the same in the loaded metal lattice. While the deuterium-loaded metal lattice may initially be at room temperature, the new method creates an environment where individual atoms achieve equivalent fusion-level kinetic energies." End quote. This is a fusion device which works more like an RTG, and can become a highly efficient particle source for medical, research, or utility applications while consuming only electricity and fuel. Let's identify the main components of a lattice confinement fusion setup per the experiments conducted by NASA and establish how it works. Firstly, the experiments used deuterium-deuterium reactions. 
While experiments were done using various materials with both neutron moderating and semiconducting properties, the most success seems to have been using erbium as the metallic lattice. The fuel contained in the lattice are known as deuterons, consisting of a proton and a neutron. These are simply deuterium atoms. As the beam strikes the fuel material, it produces an effect known as electron screening, where the presence of charged particles reduces the electrostatic field of nearby atoms. This allows deuterium fuel atoms to fuse more readily, permitting fusion at lower temperature and pressure. The radiation beam eventually imparts enough energy on a deuteron atom to split it into its proton and neutron via photodissociation. This opens the door to two different pathways for the product neutrons either a fusion reaction or a screened Oppenheimer Phillips stripping reaction. The fusion reaction occurs when a neutron collides with a static deuteron, which then impacts another deuteron with sufficient energy to overcome the Coulomb barrier and fuse, which releases helium-3 and a neutron, or tritium and a proton. An Oppenheimer Phillips reaction, or OP reaction for short, also occurs when the dissociated neutron impacts a deuteron. However, instead of this rebounding deuteron impacting another deuteron, instead it attempts to bind with one of the erbium nuclei, which splits the deuteron into a neutron and proton. The neutron rebounds and continues the reaction, while the proton converts the erbium nucleus into thulium. Each event in these two pathways will release energy, and if desired, lots of fast neutrons. The obstacle facing researchers now is to find the optimal materials and configuration to increase overall efficiency. The limitations of current designs will become more clear if we look at some real-world applications of LCF. Many proposals for exploration probes to the icy worlds of the outer solar system have discussed using fission reactors for power and heat. A 2022 NIAC-funded proposal discusses replacing this fission reactor with a fusion LCF system. This design doesn't only use fusion, though. It uses the LCF method to produce fast neutrons, which can then be used to fast fission-depleted uranium or thorium fuel. By using fusion to provide fast neutrons, to also initiate fission reactions, we can overcome the efficiency limits of current LCF designs to make these systems attractive over alternatives. While currently unsuitable for commercial power applications due to the cost of fuel, LCF fast fission systems can provide massive amounts of energy to a spacecraft in a remote environment. Beyond using hybrid fusion fission systems, we'll need to experiment with a range of lattice materials to establish better efficiencies. Metals are used because they allow electrons to flow freely between the fuel and the lattice, which eases traversal of the Coulomb barrier and reduces the power needed. But it's possible materials we haven't tested so thoroughly, like liquid metal, may provide even better efficiencies. Further exploration of LCF could lead to systems suitable for small-scale power production, even on Earth. The only issue is to make these devices economically competitive with small modular reactors we currently use. Thanks for tuning in guys, I hope you enjoyed today's content. If you did enjoy, leave a like and go ahead and leave a comment too, that really helps the channel. And subscribe for more videos like this. Thank you.